<clears throat> Do you want me to start or? No, I can go. Uh, just waiting until we get live here. Hello, uh, my name is Chad Curtis. I am the clerk for the Prince Edward of, uh, for the clerk County of Prince Edward. I'm joined here tonight by Andy Harrison, the chief building official for Prince Edward County. So this is a noise information bylaw uh, information session. So we've uh, reached out, we've put out messaging in the newspapers on our the town we the county's website and other sources, and we're. Um, Soliciting feedback from the public in regards to the noise bylaw that will be coming before council in the near future. So for everyone who's following along on YouTube right now, and we probably have a bunch of people that are in the Zoom waiting room, I'm just going to give a little brief overview of how the night's going to go. So first off, um, we're going to hold you in a, the waiting room until it's your turn to speak. When it's your turn to speak, I will bring you into the Zoom meeting. And at that point in time, you'll have five minutes to address Mr. Harrison in, uh, in regards to the noise bylaw. That includes any responses from him. Once your comments are done, I'm going to uh, gently remove you from the Zoom room and we're going to let the next person in. Um, so one thing I would like to stress is that if you are following the meeting on Zoom, when we bring you into, if you're following the meeting on YouTube, when we bring you into the Zoom waiting room, if you could please mute the YouTube, just because there is a little bit of audio feedback and it can be kind of distracting and uh, it doesn't really allow the free flow discussion that we're aiming to achieve right here. Um, so before you start speaking, just please clearly state your name um, and you'll have five minutes to address Mr. Harrison. Um, Andy is going to provide a uh, PowerPoint presentation to start this meeting. So I am going to bring that up and share it on my screen for everyone to see. And the PowerPoint's just a high level overview of uh, the noise bylaw at its current state. Okay, uh, hello everyone. My name's Andy Harrison. I'm the Chief Building Bylaw Enforcement Officer for Prince Edward County. I've been with the county now for over 25 years and with the Building Bylaw Department for 21 years. Um, the, the purpose of this session is to bring forward a, a new draft bylaw for council to uh, recommend and approve. We were, are, like Chad had said, we we're looking for feedback from the public to um, bring ideas and what the municipality and the public are looking for with regard to enforcement and implementation of, of the noise bylaw. Um, it's already been taken to council uh, for a, a, a review to give us uh, the go ahead to host this um, this. Uh, this session. So the current noise bylaw was passed in 2002. It uh, repealed some uh, bylaws from uh, Picton, Bloomfield, Amelia'sburg, Hallowell, and North Marysburg. Uh, the issue we had was it was broad in scope and it basically included any unusual noise that would disturb others. So, and there was no time restrictions other than it exempted construction noise between seven in the morning and six at night, and it exempted council approved events and emergency vehicles. So basically there was no exemptions for agricultural uses, any kind of, uh, uh, let's say lawn gardening, uh, domestic construction, that type of thing was basically covered within the bylaw and your, your neighbors could complain if they didn't like uh, when you were, were doing your work on your own home. Uh, so then the bylaw was amended in 2011. And at the time we were, uh, council was dealing with complaints more about um, some commercial, let's say bar establishments and some outdoor venues that were hosting uh, musical events and that type of thing. And they were trying to promote those uses within the county. So what they had done at the time was put in a, a limit as to when 
you could produce noise on your property. And what came of that was the 60 decibels of sound um, from either a residential or a commercial zone or other than a residential zone that restricted noise to that level in a residential zone after 11 p.m. and before seven in the morning. And then for anything other than a residential zone, it was 2 a.m. until 7 a.m. The, the problem we had with that was it was interpreted that you could make all the noise you liked between seven in the morning and 11 o'clock at night on a residential zone and then basically till two in the morning for a commercial zone. And there was uh, limited um, times for enforcement. And it was also, um, the other issue we had is by using the sound meters and decibel limits, it made it hard to enforce for uh, let's say the provincial, or provincial offenses officers, which are our county bylaw officers, and the OPP as well, who were doing, let's say, a majority of the uh, noise complaints after hours. So they most of the time didn't have a sound meter available. And the other thing that we found is if we did charge somebody and we went to court, um, the level of let's say that we had to rise for a prosecution was how often our meters were tested, were they professionally uh, done, were the officers properly trained, were they um, uh, tested every morning to make sure they were uh, working properly. So our, their level of standard was, was way too high and too hard to uh, prosecute in court. So we weren't we were never successful proceeding with a, a prosecution under using the, the decibel limits. Uh, Jack, could you skip ahead? Uh, also at the time, the uh, construction noise was changed from 7 in the morning till 7 p.m. Um, and that was amended in 2015, I believe. Um, since that time, our noise bylaw have increased due to uh, tourism, social gatherings, uh, and, and especially in the, in the recent years with the short-term accommodations. Because what's happened is we have a change in behavior. The people that are renting the short-term are here for a weekend or whatever, and they are to, here to enjoy themselves. And uh, they are the ones that are creating uh, let's say a majority of our complaint calls. It is the OPP that respond to these calls after hours. Our bylaw enforcement is typically emergency only and our staff are not trained or equipped to deal with these type of uh, nuisance noise complaints. So we would either have to take an OPP officer with us or it was easier for them just to respond on their own. Uh, we do have some other issues where we have commercial and industrial zone properties that, that are close together. So they're not very compatible in uses. Um, we have a hotel right in the middle of a village that is looking to host uh, weddings and other type social events. And they're surrounded by uh, single family dwellings. So it creates a bit of a conflict. So these are the type of things that we're trying to, to change within the bylaw and address within the bylaw. Um, it's what was brought forward to council originally and what you've seen as the draft bylaw at that original meeting, uh, council did come forward with a couple recommendations, but they haven't been put in the draft as of yet. Um, so one of them is the, uh, the issue of chainsaws, leaf blowers, and uh, wood chippers, any loud um, uh, equipment had a daytime or restriction of eight till five during the day and then only available on Saturdays and then a Sunday and a holiday restriction as well, 
what council recommended right away was that the chainsaws, wood chippers, those type of things be included with any other domestic or construction noise and that the Sundays and holidays be uh, removed and treated the same as every other day. Um, the bylaw itself, I've reviewed the other municipalities locally uh, and really the one you're looking at was based mostly on the uh, city of Belleville, Quinney West, Napanee and the, the other single tier municipalities. So their formatting is virtually the same. Uh, the content is pretty much the same throughout. So what does change is the type of noise and the times that they're permitted or prohibited. Uh, going to this type of structure, um, we, we see it does work in other municipalities. It allows the enforcement officers some discretion dealing with complaints because then it can be the type of noise, the location of the property. So if you're out in a, a rural area and you're, you're cutting wood or whatever, and you start at, let's say, 6.30 in the morning and there's nobody around to hear it, well, then we're not gonna be responding to a noise uh, complaint of that nature. Uh, also, agricultural uses have been exempt since 2011. So anything to dealing with an agricultural operation is is exempt the only complaint we've received over the years for agricultural is the bird bangers uh, but there is an appeal process through omafra the ontario ministry of agriculture food and rural affairs that if the placement of a bird banger um, is too close to a dwelling or they're using it improperly or uh, the wrong time of day the uh, OMAFRA does have an appeal process that they will um, review and recommend changes to the farmer and how he's operating the bird bangers. That is the only complaint that we've received over the years with regard to agricultural. Um, so the, um, we've also put in there about, oh, Continuous noise, uh, dogs barking, those type of things. Um, the thing about dogs barking is we're looking at consistently barking. We have had instances where people will leave their dog tied up in the yard and go away for the day and the dog will bark for hours. Those are the, the types of um, issues that we're trying to address with that addition to the bylaw. It also gives us something to, uh, to, to use as a baseline. So if the dog's out there for three hours in the morning, I would say that's consistent barking. If he's only out there for a half an hour and then he's back in and then a half an hour later, that necessarily wouldn't fall within what we're trying to address. Um, the, the new bylaw does have some uh, time frames for uh, just domestic work. Um, we've had to change that as well because there was a, an eight till eight for uh, let's say lawn care and that type of thing. But in the prohibited times, it was only addressed as an 11 to seven. So 11 PM to seven in the morning, you weren't allowed to do it. And it didn't match with what was in the um, exempted times. So it's those type of things will be addressed. Um, and now we're also looking at an application to council for exemptions uh, where you can pay a fee. So if somebody wanted to host a, uh, let's say, a, a music function on a property and they wanted to go beyond the 11 o'clock, then they would apply to council for, for an exemption and council would approve or not approve based on the conditions that the uh, proponent was putting in place or the security or whatever they needed to ensure that they didn't go over the time allotted, they didn't have too many people there and, and ensured that they were in compliance with their uh, conditions of the, the permit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I've mentioned the uh, the comments from council already about the change in restrictions. 
uh, with domestic tools. Um, I think a lot, I've received a lot of comments over the last two weeks <laughs> that were a lot along this lines as to people were with the new bylaw, they didn't have time to cut their grass or, or look after getting their firewood together. We're not trying to interfere with somebody's livelihood or their ability to heat their home or maintain their yard. So that is why we're going through this process to get input and see if we can come up with a, um, a bylaw that will uh, work for, let's say, the majority of the, uh, the residents of Prince Edward County. Uh, we can't please everybody, but we're going to try to please as many as we can. Uh, we're going forward. So I know that uh, our communications uh, director has had upwards of over 2,000 responses through the uh, Have Your Say website. So there is a lot of uh, interest in this topic. Um, so we're looking at a lot of different things. So we're, um, we've got our list of offenses to regulate certain noises. So it gives us a, a baseline to write a ticket for an offense. What you see is basically if somebody is having a loud party and the OPP show up, they have the ability to write a $200 ticket and a kind of cease and desist. If we have a serious offense, so if we have a, let's say a, a large uh, commercial venue that is consistently working outside of the permitted times and, and causing a disturbance, we can use the Provincial Offenses Act, which allows us to issue fines to a corporation up to $50,000 for a first offense and a homeowner up to $25,000 for a first offense. And then those fines can be doubled for any uh, second or continuous offense. So we still have that option for our, let's say repeat or serious offenders. Okay. Um, so I guess that's uh, what I wanted to kind of bring forward at this time. Uh, so we're open to comments and questions. And the survey will be open, I believe, until April the 9th. So the uh, the link is there on that uh, the PowerPoint. So you can still get your comments in if you don't get a chance to uh, speak today. Hello, Andy. We have Leslie joining the meeting right now. Okay. Or Anne, sorry. She's joining. Hello, hello. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. Good, good. My name is Ann Taylor. And uh, I guess I'm alphabetical, so I got to be first, thanks. Um, my experience um, in, in various ways uh, is that the term construction negates any, any regulatory compliance of any kind, bylaw, zoning, like you name it. If you say you're construction, you can do anything you like. And so I'm wondering, um, you know, given that it, it, it's perhaps during the day construction noise that at least I'm personally most concerned about and maybe others are, how does this uh, change in bylaw help me or anyone that has the same kind of issues around consistent loud noise around us in construction, how does it help? Uh, I guess the construction noise during the day, it's limited to 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So really at this point, it, I can't say it will help you out. Um, it, it's there to allow the, the normal construction practices that you see during the day. So that includes highway construction, 
um, road work, any infrastructure work and uh, house construction and new builds, like um, any, any kind of uh, construction of that type is still exempt through the, the daytime hours. Right, so that, you know, I mean, surely even, even if it's daytime, there should be a limit to what a neighbor to a construction site should need to endure. You know, 60 decibels is quite loud, but even if, you know, it just seems like there's this giant hole to step through, which is that time frame where you can do anything you like, particularly if you're construction. And that's the issue we had with the decibel limit and allowing noise up to 11 o'clock or two o'clock in the morning. As far as construction, I guess the reasoning behind not limiting it is normally the correct construction in a neighborhood or whatever will move on. It's, it's a, a temporary or should be a short term unless you're in the middle of a new subdivision. So normally if uh, somebody next door is building a house, it's three, four or five months and then it's, it's over. Road construction is typically the same. So I think that may be the reasoning why it gets exempt is it's not a permanent thing that's gonna be there for, for years and years, I would, I would hope. Well, exactly. So, but, but I think that time frame also matters because I think, you know, your examples you cite are short, like five months, 10 months, 12 months. How about four years, five years, which is, is literally the situation I'm in. So, you know, perhaps that could be constrained by somehow defining what construction or what temporary means in this case. Um, Anyway, that's my concern. And then my other question quickly is, should I have an issue um, besides calling the 55 numbers I already have from, a, from the, the county's point of view, who do I call? You would call, call the bylaw enforcement office. It's at uh, 613-476-2148. And the extension is 2046. Goes directly to the bylaw enforcement office. And there's also a, uh, an email address, uh, bylaw at pecounty.on.ca. Okay, great. Um, I just hope you might consider, you know, the county is, is developing like crazy, as you know, um, and, and maybe there could be refinement of, of some of these definitions, you know, quite apart from the dog barking about what construction and what temporary means that might help a lot of people. Okay, thank you for your comment and that will go forward with uh, the review to council. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Um, we have Ben joining. And I'm gonna remove you from the room, sorry. Thanks. So we have Kathy joining as well, sorry. forward with uh, the review to council. Thank you. Hello, Kathy, could you please mute your YouTube? Oh. Thank you, Ann. Um, we have Ben joining. And I'm gonna remove you from the room, sorry. Thanks. We have Kathy joining as well, sorry. How do I mute my YouTube? Either close it or there should be a little, if you hover the mouse over the, the meeting, there should be a speaker button that you can mute. Oh, well, Kathy, could you please mute your YouTube? All right, Kathy, you have five minutes to ask Andy Harrison a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I just closed YouTube. Hi, Andy, Kathy Harris here. Hello. Um, I have, um, some of my questions were answered. Uh, just a clarification on the roles. You're saying that the use of chainsaws, chippers and leaf blowers have now been added into uh, the power equipment category? That was a recommendation of council at the original meeting when the draft bylaw came forward that they would be included with the other, let's say, lawn maintenance equipment. 
which don't have the same, yeah, they don't have the same restriction. So has the draft been amended to include that recommendation? It, it will be amended, yes, before it goes back to council. Okay, great. Um, the other thing is, um, could you define extremely, uh, sorry, yelling, shouting, and hooting? Um, how, how does that apply to children in a schoolyard, um, say people that are at a baseball game, playing a game of baseball and the, the people in the bleachers observing or the teams themselves? How does that apply to say a rally or a protest in downtown Picton? It, it wouldn't apply to any of those circumstances. Um, that is in just about every bylaw that I've read. And my explanation would be that somebody coming out of a bar or out in the middle of the street in the middle of the night after a few drinks and is yelling and hollering. I think it goes back to the old days where they used to have barkers in the street trying to sell their wares. And it's okay. just been left in bylaws forever. We would not be chasing... Uh, little kids playing in a pool or a, a ball game or a soccer game or anything like that. That's not the intent. Okay. So I can still hoop when I make it up to the top of Lake on the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and uh, so that is, that was the extent of my questions. Thank you very much, Andy. Okay. You're welcome. We have David Beach joining. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and uh, so that is that was the extent of my questions. Thank you very much, Andy. Hello, David. You're on mute. Yep. I mean, I'm ready to go. Yeah. Hi. Um, and uh, so that is. Could you put YouTube on mute, please? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay, you're welcome. Hello, David. You have five minutes to uh, talk to Andy regarding the noise by law. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Beach, and uh, thanks for taking the time to listen to our questions and comments. Um, I have been a, a resident of the county for about 20 years. I have a lot of questions, but my main concerns are with the noise bylaw as it revolves around the issues of commercial operations, generally referred to as Airbnbs or STAs that are often owned by corporations that have begun operating in residential areas. I'm going to preface my concerns with my own situation, but I believe that my situation is not unusual and likely will become more common. My neighbors sold their house last year and it was purchased by a corporation. It's now a full-time STA advertising as sleeping eight people and renting for over $11,000 per week. Our neighborhood's relatively quiet and peaceful. There are family events in our neighborhood, but these events number one or two per year and permission is sought from neighbors. Although the property description says no parties or events, there's no description of what an event is. And I'm concerned that the size and cost of this property, along with its beautiful setting, make it suitable for weddings or other celebrations. So I have two questions and a couple of comments. Um, if there's a violation of the bylaw, is it the guest or the property owner that is responsible for the penalty? And as a follow to that, if the property owner is responsible, would the repeat incidents be considered subsequent offenses with appropriate escalation of penalties? Um, I can, I can answer both of those questions. Thank you. Yes, the, the owner is responsible. The guests may be charged as well, but the owner is ultimately responsible. For the short-term accommodations, we have put in place a licensing program that does include substantial fines. So if there are issues, if they're operating outside of what's permitted, they can be fined up to $1,000 for a first offense, and then that goes up. Um, if we have multiple offenses, we can revoke their license. So if there's like, if we get called there, the OPP are called there on, on let's say three or more occasions, then we have grounds to have their, their license revoked and then they could no longer operate as an STA. Um, 
as far as, and it is also in the bylaw, it refers to events like weddings and those type of social gatherings that include people that are not registered as guests at the STA. So if they have eight people staying there and then they have a function or a barbecue that has another 20 show up, then that is not uh, included in the license of the STA and can be uh, another offense that uh, they would be subject to a fine as well. Okay, thank you. Because um, my two comments were that if people are spending 10,000 bucks to rent the house for a week and are having a ten dollars or $20,000 wedding, a fine of a few hundred or even a thousand dollars is hardly a deterrent, you know? It's the cost of doing business. So you've dealt with that. And then I just said also that um, if there were, were recurrent offenses, could their license be revoked? And you've answered that. So <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. And beyond that, I just wanted to add to that if you do have a repeat offender, we do have the Provincial Offenses Act where we can go after a corporation up to $50,000 for a first offense if we have to go to court. So if all of a sudden these, because it's 1,000 the first time, 2,000 the second time and 4,000 the third, when they're making $11,000 a week, it isn't much of a deterrent. So in this case, we do have the option of taking them to court, charging them and going before a justice of the peace and asking for a fine of up to $50,000 at that point. And then if it's a, if we can go after $100,000, if they get charged the first time at 50,000. So we do have that available as well. Thank you very much. We have Joanne entering the meeting now. Hello, Joanne. You have five minutes to address Andy Harrison regarding the noise pillow. Okay. Um, I was just wondering why there was uh, uh, in the bylaw hooting. Um, I looked at the Belleville bylaw. There's no hooting and hollering in there. I kind of feel insulted uh, that they would even have that in there um, because it, it kind of assumes that you're a county bumpkin kind of thing. And um, also, uh, I was wondering, my dogs bark and I yell for, uh, that, at them because they're barking. Um, and I was wondering if uh, it would pit neighbor or could possibly pit neighbor against neighbor just because dogs are barking. Um, and I was wondering too about uh, farmers, if they're going to be exempt, because I know that the farm equipment runs at all times, at, at, even at night. Um, and uh, the horse farm across the road, uh, she's always yelling uh, out instructions for her riders. So um, it looks like to me that the bylaw needs some tweaking and I have those suggestions for you. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. We have Charles joining the Zoom. Yelling uh, out instructions for her riders. Oh, Charles, can you please mute your YouTube? It looks like to me that the bylaw needs some tweaking. And I have those suggestions for. Hello, Charles. You have five minutes to address Andy. Okay. Am I am I am I on now? Yes. Okay. And people, do I do I do anything else? I don't have to put off mute or stop nope. video. Okay. Yeah. My my name is uh, Chuck Winograd. Um, my family is the new owner of. Uh, the Wellington Lake Golf and, and Golf Club, Wellington, Wellington on the Lake Golf Club. Uh, my son, who has a history in the county uh, and has been there many, many times over many summers, um, has is in the process of. In fact, he just arrived this week. He's moving from Vancouver to um, the county, and he's in the process of looking for a house. Um, 
last fall, he, he brought me the idea of, 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 of buying the golf course, which had been for sale for quite some time. And I drove up with him. I'd never been in the county and it's, it's gorgeous. And uh, we had a look and played the golf course. Uh, we're both very passionate golfers. Um, and unlike, I think, virtually everybody else who had looked at the place uh, over a, quite a long period of time, we had no desire to develop it into a, a housing, uh, uh, in, into housing or, or, or anything like that. We wanted to run a golf course and Lev wanted to run a golf course and uh, I wanted to help him, help him do it. Um, it took us a while, but over the course of the next few months, uh, we reached an agreement and, and we, we bought the course in, in, in January. Uh, we convinced Paul and, and Sandy to stay to teach Lev how to run a golf course. And as I said, Lev and his dog Sarge arrived after a five-day trip and uh, he was greeted with the news of the new bylaw. Now, now I, I, I should say that over the years, Paul and, and Sandy and, and uh, our, our superintendent, Gary, have, have, have really worked very hard to um, make the golf course an enjoyable place to play without really access to capital. And our objective for the course is, is to take uh, the money that, that we make and, and frankly uh, reinvest most of it, if not all of it, into the course to make it a, a, uh, <clears throat> a, a more enjoyable place to play. I, I, I look at it and our objective is continuous improvement uh, which I might say is more applicable to our golf course than it is to my golf game. Now, the bylaw that is being introduced has clearly uh, put put our our plans at, at risk because, um, as as you know, when you look at it, uh, it it puts puts the golf course operations uh, uh, into a bit of a dither because uh, uh, we we uh, start to mow our course. Um, and, and which we have to do every day, uh, the greens and, and, and we have to do mowing greens and, and rough and, and uh, the fairways. And we start at, at, at 6 a.m. or earlier and our first tee off is at 7.30. And the time of eight o'clock as, uh, uh, as, as a beginning time to be able to use mowers and, uh, and nine o'clock on Sunday a runs really contrary to the way you can run a golf course. And if we had to run a golf course like this, it would, it, it would, it would clearly change things. Uh, it, it, we wouldn't be able to mow every day. Uh, we basically um, would have to lose two or, two or more of the most, well, more than two hours of the most important um, time that you get to play golf, uh, more, on, more on Sunday. Uh, and and uh, most importantly, uh, we we might have to have uh, uh, golfers on 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 the we on the course uh, uh, while there are workers. And I, I know if you've ever had to do that, um, it's just not safety and not something that we we could really do. Uh, uh, um, so so it really does put in 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 in, in our, our our hopes for the golf course in in into. Uh, uh, a, a bit of abeyance because basically we, we seem to have been caught in, 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 this, in, in this bylaw. Um, it also makes it more, it's going to make it more difficult. I mean, clearly this, 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 this uh, course, <clears throat> well, I had a better year last year in the pandemic and hopefully uh, this year, this year uh, the pandemic won't last long enough for us to have as good a year as we had. Uh, last year, but but frankly, this course hasn't made much money, and and uh, uh, effectively, the business model is is very difficult, and this will make it uh, uh, virtually impossible. Um, so I, I I would say that um, uh, I I I don't think that anybody woke up in the morning and said, um, "Let's go after the golf courses." I, I did ask uh, Sandra, and and and. Paul, whether we had ever had any complaints about noise at the golf course, because as, as, as most of you know, we're on, on, uh, on a housing development and they've told me we've never had any complaints about noise. And I don't think that this was the root of the, uh, of the problem, but clearly we're caught, caught in this. And, and uh, 
Um, I, I think that uh, what, we, what we've got to do is, is uh, stay calm, which we're doing, and try to figure out a way around this. And I think that uh, there will be a way around it. But I can, I can, I can tell you that, uh, that uh, in fact, if, if, if there weren't, it would just be a very difficult uh, business proposition. We, we, uh, we actually, as somebody mentioned earlier, have, have uh, as our um, modus operandi, our, our maintenance employees, the people who do all the work are actually um, agricultural employees and classified as such. And, and we're gonna be interested in going for an exact exemption. And we're just hoping that uh, we, can, we can get this uh, solved very quickly because our focus right now uh, is everybody working hard to make sure this golf course gets into sh good shape for, for the season that, that hopefully was gonna start early this year. And uh, we certainly are going to ask, ask and I, I would like to know just what we can do to get this thing um, in a position where it, where it, it, it basically uh, um, is is a it is is reasonable for a business like ours. So thank okay. you for the time, and uh, that's really all I've, that that the only question I have, and uh, uh, hopefully we can get it answered quickly so we can get on with the show. Okay. Yeah, I had mentioned earlier about uh, a process from council how they had already were looking at removing the Sunday and holiday. Uh, changes to the times. Um, it's also a matter of looking at the golf course or other similar type uses as, let's say, we can't treat them as, as a normal residential use. And you do have different conditions to meet. So that those recommendations can be taken forward to council and, and, and get their uh, input on how they would like to go forward. Yeah. Is that something that can be accomplished before we get into the golf season? I believe so. This is going back to council. Probably won't be until uh, the end of April, first part of May. So there won't be any changes to the bylaw. So it won't affect you at this point, um, at least till let's say the first part of May. And if these items get addressed, then it shouldn't affect you at all. If, if council has the opinion that the golf course should be treated a little differently as, a, as an agricultural use well, or something. That, that's great. That's great because I, I don't think the council would want to be blamed for all the bad lies that you could get on our golf course. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. We have Michael joining the meeting. Hello, Michael. Hi. You have five minutes. Okay. Oh, okay, so start. Um, yeah, we, uh, my uh, husband Alex and I, we are the uh, new owners of one five seven eight six where Fields on West Lake used to be. We're we'll calling it the Eddie, and we just wanted to understand a little bit about how the bylaw impacts, obviously, a property like this. It's had history with noise problems. So, is it just trying to understand um, how the noise is measured? Um, is it when it leaves the property? Obviously, we've got a barn that we're um, having to to mitigate sound from. So is the, when the noise leaves the property or is it when it would leave the barn? And is it also, is it indoor events like a barn like that or is it noise I thought earlier in the presentation it was supposed to apply to outdoor events? So just trying to kind of understand how it impacts us because much like the previous person, we've uh, just invested quite a lot in, and it does change quite dramatically our um, business model if we have to say to, to uh, wedding couples that we have to stop music at 11 it's uh we've taken the position to stop 30 is what we've said just to give lots of time to quiet down and get off the property long before the, the previous bylaw of two o'clock and we're just wondering if this changes that that we now need to update contracts and things and tell brides and grooms that uh it's uh a 11 o'clock stop their wedding okay um for that question I believe the intent of the amendment was for the outdoor venues when we have uh, music festivals in, in a field or we have, um, 
We have a lot of functions at the fairgrounds in, in Picton, those type of events where you're in the middle of a residential area. If the, if the, uh, the music is outside, then the intent is at 11 o'clock. I don't think we're, the intent of council or, or mine was to limit a, a commercial venue that has like an indoor area like yourself to say, okay, 11 o'clock, you're done. Uh, especially when you could operate till two o'clock previously. So, and as far as the noise uh, reception, it goes by where the noise is heard, not necessarily where it's coming from. So, because typically it could be louder right at your front door, but you go to your neighbors and there's enough trees, bushes, whatever to, to deaden the sound before it gets there. I was just going to say, we just ordered a lot of trees. So as that was part of my question. We've ordered a whole lot of trees and shrubs to try and dampen the sound as yeah. it travels across the property. So I just wanted to make sure that that was going to be useful for me. I'm familiar with the property and I know there was a lot of work done with the, uh, the sound within the barn itself to, to deaden the sound so it wasn't traveling like it was. Yeah. So, so even though the by like the way the bylaws worded, it doesn't, as I saw specify indoor versus outdoor. So if this being a barn, it's, you know, it does have some sound escape, which we are working hard to try and reduce and mitigate, but there's still at the end of the day, there is some. So the fact by the virtue of being an indoor event, it would be exempt from the 11. Yeah, that the recommendation going forward will be for the outdoor functions at 11. And then anything indoor, we'll leave that at the discretion of council because they're, it was council uh, 10 years ago that decided on the two o'clock in the morning for commercial venues okay. to be able to, to operate. So we'll leave that at that council's discretion. Okay, and then just one last question that popped to mind. So the decibel level, it used to be 80, right? And it's now gone down to 60. It was 60. So there's no decibel levels being used anymore. So it's okay. basically uh, gonna be at the discretion of the, the officers on site to say yes, it's loud or no, it's not. Like, would it disturb the the average person kind of thing? Yeah. Is what we were trying to to get to. Okay. Yeah. Great. That's very helpful. Thanks. We just we've been putting a lot of time into trying to mitigate the sound and plan things to help mitigate the sound. So just wanted to make sure um, that it was um, you know, timely. Yeah. Okay. Thanks awesome. so much. Thanks Appreciate so much, it. Have a good one. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. We have Ben joining the Zoom call now. Okay. Great. That's very helpful. Thanks. We've been putting a lot of time into trying to things to help mitigate sounds. So just want to make sure. Uh, Hello, Ben. Are you there? Yeah, Zoom we're here. Now. We're here. Perfect. You have five minutes. Hi. Sorry. We are actually two two people. I'm Mareka and Ben. Um, we are in a similar situation to the previous speakers. We are the new owner operators of the Hayloft Dance Hall. Um, we only very recently purchased it, so this noise bylaw is very worrying to us, I guess. Um, I mean, in the, the draft notes that we read, it said amplified music and entertainment and commercial and industrial zones between 11 and 10 a.m. It doesn't say anything about indoor versus outdoor that I've read. And obviously we would be hugely affected by this. Um, currently the Hayloft, and this is something we would continue, uh, takes great care in keeping the decibel levels within um, regulation levels and it's measured nightly and very carefully by the sound technician. Um, and I guess I just am a bit unclear about if it is indoor, uh, will, if indoor events are, are going to be allowed, will that be very clearly reflected? Because right now it seems to read like any amplified music after 11 p.m. is going to be subject to this bylaw. 
Yeah, that was something when, when it was added to the bylaw, the intent was for outdoor venues to be restricted to 11 o'clock. And then the indoor venues basically um, would carry on. It'll be at the discretion of council as to if they're gonna restrict it at midnight or one or whatever the case may be. Um, but for my recommendation going forward, will be for outdoor venues 11 o'clock unless they get a, a special permit from council. So if they wanted to play later, that option is available. Um, and I will be going forward in the, in the draft proposal because I've had a few comments, the same comments because we do have uh, restaurants and bars right in, in town in Picton and in Wellington that have the same, same issues. So we're, we have to be fair. We don't want to affect uh, anyone's business or like you say, your business model is to basically entertain till midnight or whatever and have everybody out by one o'clock kind of thing. So yeah, I, we're, the intent is 11 o'clock for an outdoor venue and then we'll leave it at the, or we'll see what direction council wants to go for the indoor events. So if you've already controlled the noise, then it, it shouldn't be a factor. Will we get notification? Because right now it's a, a 2 a.m. cutoff. The Hayloft typically operates to one with uh, some noise tapering that happens between 12 and yes. one. If that is gonna change, will in a kind of separate review, will we get notification of that? with an opportunity to speak because even midnight would make would significantly change our operations um yeah i guess if that is is that something that's happening in tandem or parallel to this noise bylaw the operating hours of indoor commercial well it'll all be uh, included in the bylaw but what it what will happen is before it's taken back to council we'll, we'll have a new uh, draft bylaw There'll be a report to council saying these are the changes that were recommended by members of the of the county and try to draft a bylaw that will will try to to fit uh, where we feel it should be um, there will be a no, well a notification will there be a public notification you will have the opportunity to speak to council you'll get a chance to read the bylaw once uh, the draft bylaw once it's out and then you can uh, apply to the clerk's office to do a deputation before council if you feel that it, it affects your business and you would like to to see something different within the bylaw um just as a follow-up so Assuming, for example, that, you know, we're still able to operate till one because we're classified as an indoor venue. Um, how would sounds be enforced in that case? Just by time? Because it sounds like you're getting rid of the decibel level. So I'm a little confused. Yeah. So what will happen, it'll more than likely end up as a, a time limit for the commercial and institutional uses. Because the institutional uses are the, uh, let's say, the Crystal Palace in Picton or the arenas, the town halls. That, that hold all these special events. So they may put a time restriction on whatever. It may get pumped back to one o'clock. It may stay at two. That's gonna be up to council, but that will be in the bylaw. And if they, if they set a time limit, then it's really just a time limit. There's no decibel limit to, to go hand in hand. We've we removed that because of the, the difficulty in enforcing a decibel limit when you're measuring, well, your, our meters aren't that reliable and then having them tested and everything, it was just too arduous uh, to go after anybody. Um, on that note, I guess I uh, wanted to say two things. Um, uh, the one thing, I guess, if it doesn't apply to indoors and it's just gonna be a time limit, I understand that. I think that's reasonable. Obviously, you know, doing what we do, providing live entertainment, uh, the way it's been operating for close to 50 years now, we'd want that time limit to be, you know, at least at one o'clock so that we could continue on the way it's been operating. Um, and I was just gonna comment on uh, another thing that's come up multiple times, but um, 
you know, the hooting and hollering, uh, obviously, as it applies to, you know, a concert or something like that, uh, you know, uh, it feels like it's overly broad for the purposes of, you know, reducing noise. And, you know, we obviously wouldn't want it being applied to us because we wouldn't want to, you know, tell people like, you can come to our concert, but please, you know, keep quiet. <laughs> Uh, the, the thing with the hooting and the yelling is is more for if they're at a concert or at an event, that's fine. But then if your business is closed and there are people standing out on the road waiting for a taxi or whatever and, and causing a, disper a disturbance, then that's kind of the hooting and hollering that we're, we're trying to eliminate. It's not at a special event or a sporting event or anything like that 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 isn't the attempt of, of having that included within the, the bylaw. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think my only, I mean, if this is something that we bring up at council when a noise, a potential noise change comes up that would affect us more directly, um, I would like to, I guess, have it on the record that I would really strongly like the commercial indoor noise limit to be changed to one at the absolute earliest. I think even for special event operators in the county, like the previous speakers operating weddings, I think that it is, I think it makes the area less attractive to what is a fairly flourishing industry of private events and weddings to not be allowed to celebrate to say 1 a.m. I think that's a fairly reasonable time, um, especially given that in the last year we've really been denied the opportunity to celebrate or share space or be joyous. And when that is reinstated and at whatever point, um, allowing people to yeah celebrate life and love and culture is an important part of the charm of the county, I think. So anyway. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we can take your recommendations and, and take them forward and be at the discretion of council. Okay. All right. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. So we have Ryan joining the Zoom call. Hello, Ryan. You have five minutes to address Andy Harrison. Hey there. Sorry, I'm trying to get my uh, computer situated here. Good evening, Andy. How are you? Good. Um, thank you for uh, providing this information session to obtain feedback regarding this bylaw. I think we've heard a lot of good feedback already. Commend you for your work and diligence on this. It's a good move in the right direction. And, and the acknowledgement that the past um, by law was unworkable, whether it be because of um, timing, you know, how do you enforce something in real time, uh, noise and uh, or getting your equipment audited uh, makes it much challenging. I think uh, this, this move towards recognizing certain noises is unreasonable and public nuisance, nuisances is another step in the right direction. I think it will help residents and staff more easily identify what are and not are not permitted noises. There are, I think, however, some flaws that you should try to address. Um, some of those have others have raised, and you know, I think what we heard the last two uh, speakers point out is that the exemptions in Schedule A don't or the list in Schedule A don't match up with the exemptions in Section 5. Section 5 clearly makes, makes it clear that it's an outdoor event that they're talking about. So I think just reconciling those two. I think the other one was what Ann mentioned at the beginning of her, at the very beginning of the meeting. 
And this is the notion that the exemptions in section five and in schedule A are essentially an exemption or flat exemption for that type of noise any time of the day. What that means is between the hours of, let's say construction noise, I believe it's what, seven to seven? I could stand next to your house and jackhammer for 12 hours straight. And there's nothing in the bylaw that says that's unreasonable. You have the general prohibition that says noises that are nuisances are prohibited, but then section five says this will not apply, this prohibition doesn't apply to the following exemptions. Um, so you could see, you know, and I know you mentioned there's some discretion on the count of, on the, um, by the staff to enforce it in a different way. But if I'm reading the law, there isn't that discretion. So I think one thing you might want to figure out is how to couch some language, either in the exemption itself that says sort of the provision that spy law shall not apply to any sound caused by the following uses unless deemed unreasonable by the staff or some other sort of language that gives you a little more discretion as well as makes it clear that, you know, the county's not going to stand for abuses of, of the law. And that is an extreme example, right? Someone, you know, whether it's a leaf blower 20, you know, 12 hours a day, or whether it's a jackhammer 12 hours a day, those types of situations, I think you, you'll find out they might come up a little more frequently than uh, one would hope. You know, good neighbors are always hard to com come by and uh, when you find them, they're cherished, but all it takes is one bad neighbor uh, to make your life uh, pretty miserable. Um, I think the other thing is there is one, what I'm ref going to refer to as sort of a glaring loophole, uh, and it concerns me personally. Um, I, I know we have interacted over Picton terminals a number of times on email um, and some of the noise there, and it's this, um, this uh, exemption in Schedule A that I think was intended to get at um, sort of uh, truck traffic and trucking and unloading it at Sobeys or unloading uh, containers at Metro, but it's sufficiently broad. And it, it says that Schedule A would allow loading, unloading, delivering, packing, unpacking, or otherwise handling any containers, pro produce materials or refuse unless necessary for the maintenance of essential services you can see that's permitted 16 hours of the day all of a sudden. And it essentially, I mean, whether it's Tim Hortons getting a delivery um, or some other um, location downtown, you could see why there would be a need for that exemption. If they get a delivery at uh, 10 o'clock at night, that's when they get the delivery and you don't want them making noise. But it does seem like it, it's a loophole that others might be able to use to their own um, um, effect and to the detriment of residents. Um, I think finally, I would just, you know, you had, you had talked briefly about the penalties uh, and it's nice to hear that there's this whole other section or a, another act that um, enforcement officers can use for egregious violations. Uh, the $100 limit um, seems reasonable on a limit. I know there's discretion. I, I would hope that, you know, for egregious violations, the staff takes, um, you know, especially repeat offenders, um, you, would, you would take that into account in assessing the penalty. Um, I don't know, I would be interested to hear what your interpretation of exemption number 16 is on Schedule A with respect to the loading and unloading of materials. Um, I, I'd have to <laughs> take a look at the bylaw and, and, and read it through. Um, I know it does mention um, the unloading and, and actually just recently we've had complaints about the post office deliveries in Wellington by the, at three in the morning type thing. So, but that's, we may not be able to do anything with the post office because you can't interfere with the, the, the transport of the mail. Yeah. and it's all federally regulated. So that's something I'm gonna to have to review. It'll have a legal review as well. 
for any of those interpretations, just to make sure we do have a leg to stand on if we're going after somebody, especially when we get into those big fines where we're looking at like a $50,000 charge for, for a first offense. We're gonna make sure that we've got our I's dotted and T's crossed and, and we're covered. Yeah, well, good to hear. I, I look forward to reviewing the, the next iteration and nice to put a face in the name. Okay. I look Thank forward you. to seeing you at the county sometime. Okay. Cheers, have a good one. Yeah, too. So we're letting Veronica into the meeting and Veronica is the last person in the room. Hello, Veronica, you have five minutes to address Andy Harrison regarding the noise bylaw. Okay, thank you. Will I be seeing Andy on the uh, screen or not? I'm, I'm here. If, if you can oh, there you can't see me, you can hear me. <laughs> okay, good evening, Andy. Um, thank you for the opportunity to make some comments. Um, I'm Veronica Cluett and my husband, Jack, we live on Glenora. We've been here since 1998. Uh, we purchased the land in 97. And um, at the time, this area was called a state residential. I think that's possibly changed. But I just mentioned that because I'm residential, but more rural residential than residential residential. Anyway, um, the um, bylaws that you've worked on, you have some really great thoughts about um, making it an enjoyable place for people to live and the safety and welfare and causes of public uh, nuisance. And the proposed noise draft really focuses on residential and doesn't really I think, address the industrial issues that uh, we seem to be experiencing on this side of the bay. Um, since the purchase of the property formerly owned by the Armora Docks, we have been bombarded by the industrial noise from a full quarry operation. And uh, it starts sometimes earlier than 7 a.m. and it continues throughout the day seven days, of, or well, no, six days a week. Um, the noise stems from dynamite blasting, um, removing rock from the rock face, grinding, crushing, loading, and then dumping it into barges, into metal barges, which makes one heck of a noise. Especially unnerving is the unpredictability of those noises like blasting and dumping a thousand ton or a thousand pound rock into a metal barge. It's startling and it's frightening when it's not expected. And basically you're just sort of going around your own business in the garden, in your home, whatever, and suddenly boom, you know, it, it, it's shattering. Anyway, um, I feel that the noise that we're experiencing is totally, um, not honoring the statement in the bylaw of making the neighborhood enjoyable uh, and, does, and it does cause a public nuisance. So with that in mind, I, I thought I'd, I wanted to clear up how this whole noise thing is going to be dealt with. Um, why should a noise making industrial operation be able to operate from seven until seven from Monday to Saturday when other area businesses, excluding retail restaurants, uh, wineries, et cetera, and at 5 p.m. That's question number one. Number two, uh, why should an industrial business operate on Saturdays at all? When, when that business is not dependent on continuous operation for their manufacturing process, unlike the cement plant, which has to run continuously because of their process. And you know we as residents of the area understand that, but the quarry doesn't. There's nothing to stop the quarry from stop working on Saturdays because it's not a continuous operation that's going to foul up the system. And then um, in our neighborhood we have the June Motel, the Merlin Park, Pil Picton Golf Club. We've got SDAs, and um, they all support the county tourist initiative. And I'm just wondering 
will they be compensated for their loss of business? Because, you know, this noise will cause that. So those are my first questions. I don't know. Do you want me to carry on or do you want to answer those? Um, we, we are looking at um, some mitigation measures for industrial uses. There are certain things that, because blasting is, is dealt with through, it used to be the Ministry of Natural Resources. And if anyone lived in within 500 meters of a quarry or whatever, were, um, could request to be notified before the blast. And uh, in certain cases, there is a horn that would be sounded. Um, those are, are conditions under the Ministry of Natural Resources. We don't um, control that locally. Um, we do have, uh, in some of the comments we have about the vibration and the dust control and that type of thing. So we'll, we'll be looking at that as well under nuisances uh, created through the bylaw because it is a, a noise nuisance bylaw. Um, but we'll have to have a legal opinion as to how far we can push a municipal bylaw when things are basically um, regulated by the province or by federal government. So like the ships coming in at two and three in the morning, we don't have any control over that type of uh, activity because we can't control uh, when boats come and go. That's all uh, federal jurisdiction. So we're, we're looking at what we can come up with there for an industrial zone. As far as the, uh, let's say reimbursement or looking after some of the, the tourist accommodations, I don't know if there's anything that we have available to to help them out with regard to that type of nuisance at this point. Well, what about the, um, my question on the uh, Saturday operation when the industrial business isn't uh, something that's dependent on continuous, uh, you know, they can quarry Monday to Friday, but why do they have to do it on Saturday? Uh, typically we cannot control when a business operates other than if it's a nuisance or a noise problem. We can address how they affect the neighborhood, but we cannot, let's say, control their operations or their operation schedules. So if they feel they need to operate seven days a week, I don't think we have the discretion to say, no, you're not allowed to operate on Saturday or Sunday. All we can do is try to limit the disturbance to the neighborhood through mm -hmm. like a noise nuisance bylaw. Right. Well, it sounds like this bylaw needs to get some pretty big teeth in it <laughs> to deal with stuff. Anyway, carrying on, um, in one of the documents I read, that I mean, a municipality wants to um, improve the enforceability and, it, you know, they taken away the decibel thing, which I understand from what you said earlier was too complicated. You had to, you know, kind of um, monitor devices and whatnot, and it was just not enforceable. But there, um, so now they're proposing, your, your bylaw proposed specific times and days when certain noises can take place. Um, and so I guess what I'm seeing, and, and you're putting in fine. So I guess what I'm seeing, it seems like what you're trying to do is enforce your bylaws by having fines rather than strict guidelines. In other words, okay, so somebody makes a noise, uh, you're going to say, okay, um, we're gonna fine you. And, and if they find, if you find somebody enough times, maybe you'll put them out of business. And um, I kind of, I have a problem with that because there, I have some questions. What measurements for noise will you use if you don't have decibels? I mean, I, I think a certain noise is something and if you were sitting with me on my deck, you might not think it's too bad at all. So it's a very arbitrary thing to not have a guideline of what actual noise you mean. So that's question number one. And um, who will monitor, who will come out and, and see? Will I call you, Andy, and say, Andy, come on over. 
we're getting big noise over here. <laughs> yeah, I will give you a coffee, but I mean, I don't think you're going to be leaving your desk and coming dashing over to check on noise. And then, um, will someone come every time I call you? Because I may be calling very often to the bylaw department. And I, that's not bearable for you either. So there's so many little things um, that need to be looked at. And um, how would you deal with, for example, a sudden loud noise like the blasting or the dropping of a, a ton rock in a barge? By the time you get here, the noise is over with. So, you know, all these things are very real problems that need to be addressed. And I feel like uh, maybe the, the people in question, I'm not using any names or anything, and it is a legit business, but do you really feel even the fining, the one that is from $1,000 up to 25000 on, on ongoing offenses, you know, we're talking here about multi-million, multi maybe bill, multi-billion corporation, do you think $25,000 is going to stop any noise? That's like $5 for me in my $20 purse, right? Yeah, I can't, I can't say. Usually um, those steep fines that you can be charged every day, like at $100,000 a day in some cases as a continuing offense. So there are ways to get at their pockets. if. But the, the reasoning for the time frames is like you say, you can't be there every time a rock drops. So what we're saying is, well, don't let a rock drop between 11 at night and seven in the morning kind of thing. That's what we can control. It's the same as any other enforcement tool. You set the limits. And then if you go over those limits, then you get a fine. We're not, most people will abide by the rules before you ever get to a fine. So that's that's the whole intent for bylaw enforcement saying, we would like everyone to operate within these limits and, and time constraints, but if you don't and you become a nuisance, then we will have to enforce the bylaw. It's, it's not, we're just going after, we're not out to make money or fine everybody. We're just trying to, let's say, keep the peace. And, and, and that's our, our, our goal is to actually be able to have some, let's say, control over what takes place. Okay, so then what I'm hearing is that, you know, you kind of have here a two tier system. You have a residential system and a, and a people noise system and you have an industrial system. And I don't think the two are, are going to work very well because your noise ball is for everybody, but it's not really addressing the industrial noise that I'm talking about. But that's something we would have to look at separately because it is different. Yeah, okay, so that's the point I was going to make. Um, I really feel that we need to have some clear limits before this bylaw can be really useful in certain scenarios like the ones I've been describing. I mean, I understand about leaf blowers and lawnmowers and noise at parties and blah, blah, blah. And, and I think those are easy to regulate and to keep an eye on and to follow up on. But what we're looking at, our residential area across the bay from a quarry operation and future container cargo port, um, the noise bylaws are truly ineffective. Okay, no, I can take your comments to, to council and, and bring them forward for, um, for review. Okay, do you want me to send you my notes? I can email them. Yes, you can. Okay, just to you, Andy? Yeah, you can send them to me, yes. Okay, thank you for your time. Appreciate okay, you're, it. You're welcome. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. We, we've had one more person join the Zoom waiting room, Ken, and I'm letting him into the meeting now. Hello, Ken. I think you might be joined by Leslie. You have five minutes. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, thank you for your time. Can we meet you on YouTube, please? Okay, bye bye. We, we've had one more person join the Zoom waiting room. Ken? Yeah. Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Oh, well, Kevin, you, Ken, you have five minutes. Okay, hang on. I've got to get my volume up here. Good evening, Andy. Thank you for taking the time to hear my comments. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. All right. Um, you know, I honestly believe that Prince Edward County is a special place. And um, I'm kind of picking up on the comments that Veronica made and obviously in a very similar position across the bay from Picton Terminal. So I'm very curious how this new bylaw would address uh, cargo ships unloading at night. Um, right at now, right now, um, the, uh, the limit is two in the morning till seven in the morning for, for noise and, uh, other than a residential zone. Uh, so we'll have to take any recommendations forward, like the one we just had from, uh, Mrs. Cluett and, and review them and see what is feasible and what can be enforced on an industrial zone. Uh, because like I mentioned, there are other, uh, governments that are involved with these type of uh, uses, where we, it was formerly the Ministry of Natural Resources that dealt with pits and quarries and blasting and that type of thing. We also have oceans and fisheries involved with the, the shipping part of it. So, and like I say, at this point, we can't control when a boat can come in or out of a port. Um, so this is something we will have to have a, a legal review as to what the limits we can put on a um, on a particular use, normally uh, noise bylaws or any type of bylaw is is looks at everything as a whole, and they normally can't be. Let's say you can't cherry pick what you want to go after one particular business. It has to be a, almost like a one size fits all type situation where if we set rules for industrial use, it would apply to all industrial uses, not just the one business. So that's that's gonna be part of our review process. And like I say, we will have a legal opinion when it comes to what we can and can't do when it comes to an industrial or a commercial use. Right, I appreciate that. Um, obviously we have a a tremendous number of people that are impacted by this um, this operator, which has changed significantly over the last five years. It used to be two salt shipments a year. I think everybody could put up with that kind of thing. Now it seems to be, you know, Monday through Friday, and even on Canada Day, we're getting uh, industrial activity there, and it is on the site, and that is a disturbance to the uh, adjacent residential neighborhood. And I know it mentions the idea of uh, adjacent residential users in some of the notes uh, coming from the staff report. I, I also would like to express some concern with regard to proximity, just simply due to the fact that uh, being across water and the way noise travels across water is certainly something that needs to be considered. Uh, especially when it's uh, helped out by the prevailing westerly wind, we seem to get the noise just as though we're sitting right next door to it. And uh, it's, it's been going on a long time. It's been well over four years, and there doesn't seem to be any limit to it. In fact, one of the other comments I was going to make was with regard to construction, because Picton Terminals is deemed to be in construction, and uh, but there doesn't seem to be any permit and perhaps we need to restrict the um, area or jurisdiction of this bylaw to those construction zones that have actual permits that define what's being built and what uh, what the duration will be uh, for this project because this thing seems to be just going on and on and on Okay, yeah, that's something we can look at as well. Yeah, all right. A um, couple other points I had uh, with regard to the hours of construction. I, um, 
I think they're far too broad, even seven to seven. I know construction sites can have safety meetings in the morning and that certainly isn't going to produce a great deal of noise, but to have noise before eight o'clock or after five o'clock when people are trying to have their dinner, I think that's, that's probably very broad. So that's something that I think needs to be addressed, not, not seven to seven, eight to five. Okay, I can, I can take that forward as well. And what, uh, Andy, with regard to, I taught, we had a disturbance here last summer where a couple of yachts parked out uh, in the bay and were playing loud music into the night. Does the noise bylaw address that? I think we would have, the OPP may be able to address it because they have a boat. Um, yeah. I don't know how effective we would be um, uh, charging anybody out in the water. So yeah, it, it would probably be, hopefully the OPP would be able to address something like that. Right. So with regard to Picton terminals, what hours of operation under this new bylaw would they have to adhere to? I'm gonna to have to check the bylaw um, right now because it's just a commercial operation. It may be the 11 to seven restrictions. Um, for, for noise, um, because a lot of what they do is not considered construction. It's basically shipping and handling. There is road construction going on, but that typically is just done during the day. It's the material handling and uh, the import export that's going on that is, is not addressed. So that will have to be looked at as well. So they, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm very concerned about that because that would have them dropping rock into steel barges till 11 o'clock at night. That, that's totally unacceptable. I mean, we, I think residents are entitled to a certain level of peace and quiet over a period of time. Uh, I think if this, this operator continues this way uh, in that time window that you're going to find property values in this area are going to drop in what should be one of the more sought after areas in the entire county. I, I just, I find it challenging to think that this single operator can bring, you know, that can bring that much discomfort to so many tax paying residents that are in close proximity to this. It just, I was hoping for so much more from this noise bylaw. And I guess I'll have to wait to see what the final final bylaw says, but uh, this is obviously noise. It's being generated on land in the county and it needs to be addressed. Okay, I'll, I'll take your comments forward and be part of the review. Okay, thank you, Andy. We've had one more person enter the waiting room, Kevin. Hello, Kevin, you have five minutes to address Andy Harrison. Hello, Kevin, you have five minutes. Oh, hey, Andy. Hello, Kevin. Thanks for taking the time. Yep. Um, I think you're familiar with what we do. Uh, yes, I am. Um, we already have like the 11 p.m. curfew built into our zoning. Yes. Um, so I don't think we'll be affected there. Where I'm just kind of unclear on some of the languages, do you foresee us being impacted at all, like for some of the day use we have at our space? Uh, no, I don't see anything in the bylaw that would affect your, uh, your commercial operation during the day. The, the restrictions are at, at night. So, and I had mentioned earlier that the amplified music and that type of thing, the intent was for 11 o'clock was for outside uh, venues, outdoor venues. So, but you already have that in place now. So it, that, that wouldn't affect you either. So, um, 
with regard to your your operation, I don't see how any of these changes would would affect you okay. at your location. Well, I appreciate that. That's reassuring, just because obviously with COVID, we've had to move a lot of a lot of it to more outdoor, just probably for this year. So that's reassuring to hear now, and I appreciate okay. it. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great evening. My Hello. So that uh, Kevin was the last member of the public who wished who registered to uh, speak to Andy. Um, so this wraps up the information session. Andy, do you have any parting words? Uh, no, I just let everyone know that the um, the link will still be available for the next until April the ninth. I believe Mark uh, Kerr, our communications. Uh, person will have it still open. So we will be taking comments until that point. After that, we'll probably take two to three weeks to go through all the comments. Um, Mark had mentioned we were over 2,000 uh, viewers looking at the, uh, the Have Your Say uh, survey. So we'll have a lot of material to go through before we put together a draft bylaw to take back to council. So before you leave, we just had one more resident uh, enter the waiting room. So I will let him in. Um, it's Eric. They just keep coming. <laughs> Cut them off. Hello, Eric, can you hear us? Hello, Eric, are you there? There he is. Hello, Eric, you have five minutes. We've lost Eric. Um, I have Eric's contact information. Perhaps I will share it with you. Uh, yeah, if he just wants to send me an email or, or whatever, or even yeah. he can even call me if he likes. Okay. And, and I will my extension. Up. And then, yeah, I, I will speak to him okay. another time. Because he's, he's come back. Me. We'll give him one more chance. Hello, Eric, are you there? All right. Yeah, I'll just send him your contact information. Oh, all right, last try. Hello, Eric, you keep cutting in and out. Hello, Eric, you have five minutes. We can't hear you. Eric, is your microphone on? We still can't hear you, Eric. Hello, Eric, we cannot hear you. It looks like he keeps freezing out. Yeah. Yeah, if you can just get his contact information. Eric, if you can hear us, I'm going to email you 
uh, Andy's contact information. And if you want to give him a call at some point, he'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have in regards to the noise bylaw. Okay, I'm gonna email you the information right now. All right, Andy, we'll end this right now and I'll send them. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you to everyone who followed along on YouTube and provided questions. It was greatly appreciated and will help inform this noise bylaw. Thank you, bye.